Hello, and welcome to your first convolutional neural net lecture. Unlike the architectures we've used before, we're going to talk about architectures that can take into account spatial relationships in our data, which is not something our typical feed forward neural networks have done so far. Data with spatial relationships is usually something like an image. In an image, the pixels in the image have spatial relationships with all of the different pixels around it. For instance, if I just look at this individual pixel here, it doesn't really tell me much about what's going on in this image. But if I look at the spatial relationships between this pixel and the pixels around it, it gives me a little bit more info. And I can look at even a wider area. Like I mentioned before, the feed forward neural networks that we've been using so far don't take into account these spatial relationships. So we might want an architecture that does. So let's look at some examples of cool things you can do when you take into account the spatial relationships in your data. For instance, here's a picture of my beautiful corgi puppy. One thing we might want to do with an image like this is apply filters in order to generate different features about the image. For instance, here is an example of a sharpening filter. You can see on the left it being applied to the picture of my puppy. Or we might have something like a blurring filter. Here we're basically averaging a pixel with all of the other pixels around it, thus creating this blurring effect. And we can learn other interesting things too, like this is an edge detector filter. Here, this is looking at horizontal edges. If you go back to the original picture, you can see that there's a very clear horizontal edge here because the color of my dog's collar contrasts with the color of her fur. You can see this picked up by the horizontal edge detector filter, as well as other horizontal edges. Similarly, here we have a vertical edge filter. The idea with all of these filters is that we're going to take them and of course they're just matrices of numbers and we're going to slide them across the images in order to create these outputs. This process of taking the filter and sliding it across the image is called convolution. On the screen you can see a gif of what it looks like to take that filter represented by that red box and slide it across the image. This process of sliding the filter, also sometimes called a kernel, across the image is the convolution. Every time that our filter or kernel lands on the image, we take all of the pixels that it's landed on, multiply it by the weights in the filter, and add them all together in order to get our output. And here's another example where we've taken our filter and we've slid it over. We're again taking the values in the filter, multiplying it by the pixels in the image that it's landed on to get our output. Now we'll talk a little bit more about this math later, but right now the idea to understand is that we're taking filters and we're sliding them across our image in order to get some type of of useful output. This output might be something like an edge detection. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that when we have our filters, we're taking that same exact filter and we're sliding it across all of the different parts of the image. In a convolutional neural network, this is referred to as weight sharing. The weights or the numbers in the filter are the same no matter where that filter is on the image. This weight sharing is really useful because if you think about the way that you think about images, you can recognize that there is a heart in this image, whether it's here or down here at the bottom left. By using the same weights in the filter, we're basically building a filter that can detect certain things no matter where it sees them in the image. This is really useful because then we don't have to learn how to detect things like cats or flowers differently depending on where they are in the image. And while weight sharing does have some biological inspiration, another huge benefit of weight sharing is that it limits the number of parameters that we then have to learn in our model. If we had to learn different weights for our filter at every single position it could end up, that would be a huge number of parameters for our model to estimate. All right, so now we've talked about basically applying filters to images by using the process of convolution where we take a filter and we slide it across our image in order to get our output. But what does that have to do with neural network? Well, in the previous examples, I showed you some very simple filters that could be used to process an image, but it's not really that easy to choose what filters you might need in order to do things like classify images. So what if we didn't have to choose? What if instead we let our neural network choose by using gradient descent and backpropagation in order to learn the weights 
the numbers in the filter, that will create the filters we need in order to accomplish our task. The architecture of convolutional neural nets actually looks a little similar to the feedforward neural networks we've been building in the sense that we're just building stacks of layers on top of each other. The convolutional layers represented in blue are basically learning what filters to apply to our image. Then, as you can see, we'll basically compress our image a little bit and then learn more filters. And then we'll compress and apply more filters and compress and more filters, etc. This allows convolutional neural nets to learn hierarchical feature representation. What this means is that the initial convolutional filters tend to learn things that are very fine grained patterns or textures. As we move throughout the convolutional net, we get more higher level features. For instance, in this image, you can see that at the very beginning, we're learning very simple things like horizontal lines or a little nose. Those features are then combined together in later layers of the convolutional net to make more complicated features like ears or an entire eye. Those are then combined to help decide whether or not an image has a cat in it. One really cool way to remember this is through something called neural style transfer. This is basically when we take an image and we remake it in the style of another image. For instance, here we have an image of a cat and we want to have that image of the cat, but with a different style, for instance, like Starry Night. When we're doing neural style transfer, essentially what we're doing is making sure that the high level representations, the content of the image, matches the content image. For instance, even though our cat has a different style, we still want our neural network to say yes, this is a cat. On the other hand, because we want it in the style of our style image, we're going to make sure that the lower level layers are matching that image. In other words, we want the patterns and textures to match our style image, but we want the actual content, what is in the image, to match our original content image. One other thing that's important to know is that because we're learning this hierarchical feature representation, we're often applying ReLU activation functions because it's basically like saying, is this feature present or not in this image? So as you can see in this image, typically convolutional architectures will have one or more convolutional layers. They'll send that output through ReLU, downsample, and then repeat the process over and over. Remember, because we have hierarchical feature detection, as we move through the convolutional net, we're basically learning higher and higher level features, and eventually those features can be used to do something like classify whether an image is a cat or not. All right, it's finally time to look a little bit deeper at how the math of convolutional layers works. Remember that the process of convolution basically is taking a filter and sliding it across our image in order to get an output. What's actually happening under the hood when we're doing a convolution and sliding that filter is we're taking that filter which is made up of a bunch of weights. For instance, here we have that blurring filter from before. Every time that filter lands somewhere, it lands on a little segment of pixels from our image. We're basically creating a weighted combination of all of the pixels that our filter landed on. The weights are determined by the weights of the filter, and the things that it's combining are determined by where that filter has landed on our image. Essentially what we do is we take each of these weights and multiply it by the pixel value that is underneath it. We then repeat that for all of the different values in our filter and we add them all together. So each of these pixels is going to be weighted by a weight from the filter. Then we will add all of these weighted pixel values together to get our final output. And while we usually represent this in at least two dimensions, so you can sort of see how the process of convolution is working, you can also think of this as a feed forward layer. For instance, let's take this small three by three image and basically unstack or flatten it in order to get just a line of input. While we typically show convolutions as a filter literally sliding over at least a two-dimensional space, we can also represent this process the same way that we do a feed-forward layer. For instance, let's take this 3x3 image and basically unstack its pixels so we get just a line of inputs like we would with a feed-forward neural network. 
when we do the process of convolution, we're basically taking various inputs, multiplying them by weights, and these weights come from this filter that we're sliding across our image, and we multiply them together and then add them together in order to get our output value. Then when we slide the filter over, we're basically doing the same thing, but with different pixels. For instance, here the orange weight is applied to this pixel the yellow one to this pixel, the green one to this pixel, and the blue one to this pixel. And then we repeat that process again as we slide our filter, and one last time. This is just a different way of representing that convolutional process that's happening. You can see it's basically like a feed-forward layer, except it's not densely connected. In other words, each of our inputs is not necessarily connected to each of our outputs in the next layer. And we have weight sharing going on. Instead of each of these weights being different, they're actually shared. In other words, we're forcing this weight and this weight and this weight and this weight to be the same number. So you can basically think of the convolutional operation as a feed-forward layer that is not densely connected and shares weight. Thus, this representation is the exact same thing as this. Just to take a deeper look at this, here's another representation of this convolutional operation. At every iteration, we take our filter and we slide it across our image. We then multiply whatever the filter weight is by whatever pixel it landed on top of. When we apply that to every pixel that is under our filter currently, we then get one of our outputs. Here you can see the exact math of what's happening. For instance, if we want to look at how to get the value for this pixel of the output, we basically have to take the weights determined by the filter and multiply them by the pixel values from where the filter landed. Now, as you look at this, you might be able to imagine how complicated backpropagation would be for these types of neural nets. For instance, if we wanted to look at the impact of adjusting one of our weights, we have many paths that are affected when we adjust that weight. One little note that you can file away for later. In this very simple example, take a look at the formulas used to calculate the output. And what I want you to do is look at how many times each pixel from the original image shows up in the calculation of that output. For instance, we can look at the pixel at 0, 0 and notice it only shows up once. This picture offers a little bit more of a succinct summary of what the previous slides were talking about. The process of convolution is taking a filter that contains weights, which are just numbers, and slides it across our image. Every time our filter lands somewhere, we get a single value as an output. This output is created by using the filter as weights to combine the pixel values that it landed on top of. So let's apply a blurring filter like the one we saw on my corgi puppy earlier to this grayscale image. Here you can see a live GIF of that filter being applied. As each output pixel is generated, we know that that's generated by taking the filter and sliding it across our image. Here's the final output of applying that blurring filter. And hopefully this output should make sense. We're applying a blurring filter which takes the average of all the pixels around a pixel and makes that the output value. So instead of getting harsher black and white values, we're getting a bunch of mid-level grays. Now, one interesting thing to notice is that our output is a bit smaller than our input image. Our input image was a 10 by 10 pixel image, but our output, as you can see, is 8 by 8, and that was a result of applying a 3 by 3 filter. And if you think about the way that the convolutional process works, this might make sense. If we have a 3x3 three three filter, there are only 8 ways that it can land, at least looking at it moving horizontally. For instance, I've put all of those 8 ways here on the screen. Because the filter can't land on values that are outside of our image, there's only 8 valid places to put it. And this ends up being the same for the vertical direction. Thus, even though our input was 10 by 10, our output was 3 by 3. But what if we don't want our output to be a different size? Well, then we can use something called padding. The idea behind padding is that we add extra pixels beyond the edge of our image so that our filter can land in enough places that the output of our convolution is the same dimensions as the input. For a 3x3 three three filter, if we apply a one pixel border around our image, it allows our filter to land in 10 places. 
Thus, our input and our output will be the same size. When we're using an n by n filter, n just being a variable that could be one or three or five, the size of our output is always going to be reduced by n minus one. Thus, for a three by three filter, three minus one is two, and thus our output is reduced by two. So instead of being 10 by 10, it was an eight by eight. However, with the extra padding, we're basically applying our filter to a 12 by 12 image, and thus our output will be 10 by 10, just like the original. So there's three types of padding that you should know about. The first one is valid padding, which is essentially a word for no padding at all. We only let our filter land on valid pixels from our image. Then we have same padding. Same padding adds enough extra pixels in a border around our image so that the output of our convolution will have the same dimensions as our input image. However, one interesting thing to notice is that even with this same padding, not all pixels have the same influence on our output. Let's look at this individual pixel here. Even with the padding, this pixel will never end up in these places on the filter. Thus, it only has four chances to influence the output. However, other pixels like more central ones will get to influence our output nine times because it will land each place in our three by three filter. So the final type of padding is full padding. Full padding adds enough pixels around the edge of our image so that every single pixel in our original image can be in every single position in our filter, thus having an equal chance to influence the output. All right, a really quick note. So far, all of our convolutions have been on grayscale images, so they're super simple. We're just taking a filter and we're applying it over a two-dimensional image. However, most images are not grayscale. They have red, green, and blue values. So instead of an image being like 10 by 10, it's actually something like 10 by 10 by three, where the three represents the number of color channels that are present. It can be a little tricky to think about how convolution works when your image is basically a stack of channels. So let's look at some graphics I made to help you understand how this works when we have images that are not just grayscale. With a grayscale image, convolution is really simple. All we do is we take our filter and we apply it to our image. In three dimensions, it's not too much different, but basically both our image as well as our filter will have multiple channels. So in addition to height and width, they'll also have depth. In a grayscale image, we take our filter, which here is a two by two filter, and we just place it on top of our image. If we were going to use a colored image, we'd take our same filter, which now has a depth of three, and apply it to our image, which is also a depth of three. Now, instead of having only four multiplications that we're doing and then adding together, we'll actually have 12. For instance, this weight in the filter will be applied to this pixel this weight to this pixel, this one to that pixel, and so on and so forth. All of those will then be added up together to get our final output value. Again, just a single number. And as you can see, as we cycle through these images, we're basically just repeating that process for each place that the filter can land, whether it's one dimensional or three dimensional in their color image. All right, let's pause and clarify some terminology. An image that we're going to apply a filter to is called the input. The filter that we apply is called either a filter or a kernel. When we apply a filter to an image, we get an output, and that output is either called the output or the feature map. This is because the filters that we slide across our images are supposed to learn features about the image. And so once we've applied them, we call it a feature map. So we have basically covered in depth what a convolution is, where we take a filter and we slide it across an image. But so far, we've just been moving our filters one pixel by one pixel, and we don't have to do that. So let's Let's talk a little bit about strides. When we move our filters across our image, we're typically moving them one pixel over or one pixel down, but we don't have to. Rather, we can set a stride, which is the number of pixels we move our filter over every time we place our filter. Now, you might notice that when we have strides that are greater than one, our output is going to be a lot smaller because there are fewer places that the filter can land. Thus, strides are a way to down sample our image 
page, we take a big input image and we make it smaller by basically compressing it. However, strides are not the way that we typically want to downsample our images, at least for tasks like image recognition, where we're trying to guess if an image is of a hot dog or not. Rather, we use something called pooling. Pooling are basically filters that we don't need to learn that we slide across our image in order to downsample it. The most common type of pooling we're going to use is max pooling. With max pooling, we basically have a filter that says, look at all of the pixels that I landed on and return the maximum value. For instance, when our two by two filter is here, the maximum value is six, and thus that's what our output is. Typically, we'll use strides with our max pooling layer. So instead of moving it over one pixel, we'll move it over two pixels. When we look at these four pixels, the maximum value that appears is eight, and that's what our output is. Thus, you can see that pooling is a way to downsample our image, with max pooling being returning the maximum value that occurs in that range of pixels. Now, it's important to note that when we talk about a filter in the context of max pooling, this isn't a filter with weights that we need to learn. It's a predetermined filter that just looks at all the pixels underneath it and returns the maximum value. There's no parameters that we need to learn here. So you can see as we apply max pooling, we're basically taking our image and making a more compressed version. Max pooling will reduce the size of our output, usually in half if we apply a 2x2 two two filter with strides of 2. Max pooling also helps with translational invariance. The idea behind translational invariance is that if we have a feature like this heart here, we can still detect it even if it's shifted over a little bit. Because max pooling summarizes the information in a region, it's basically like asking, is there a heart somewhere in this region? Because we return that maximum value rather than something like an average, we're basically saying, hey, is there a heart anywhere in this region? And because there is, we will return that maximal value rather than the average across all the pixels. Basically, max pooling is summarizing the information in a region. Together with weight sharing, max pooling allows us to have this translational invariance. We're able to detect different objects, even if they're in slightly shifted positions. So to review, pooling is a way to downsample the output of our convolutional layer. Max pooling works best because we're trying to detect is a feature present in this region, not what is the average presence of the feature in this region. In other words, we just want to know, is there a cat there? Not exactly where that cat is. It's best practice, at least for image classification, to do unstrided convolutions and then downsample that output using max pooling. And hopefully the reason for this makes sense. When we're doing image classification, we just want to know if the image is of a certain object. We don't really care where that object is specifically. However, there may be some applications later on where we do care, in which we might change the way we do things. All right, so now we know a lot more about the structure of this convolution evolutional neural network. Like a feed-forward network, we basically have multiple stacks of layers that flow through into each other. Typically, we'll have one or more convolutional layers and then some type of max pooling layer, followed by more convolutional layers on this now reduced output, and then so on and so forth with our pooling to downsample our image and then more convolutions and then more pooling and more convolutions and more pooling and more convolutions. Remember, the purpose of these stacks of layers is to learn that hierarchical feature representation Presentation, which we can then use in order to do something like classify our image as a cat or not a cat. In order to do that, we can take all of the features learned by our convolutional and pooling layers and then feed that into a feed-forward neural network, which will then do the actual classification for us. In other words, all of this convolutional architecture is just a way to learn useful features from an image. So in review, convolutional architecture basically allows us to learn different filters or kernels that we can slide across our image in order to learn useful features from that image. Because we want that hierarchical feature representation, we basically learn more and more compressed versions of our image as we move through the network, thus giving convolutional architectures a sort of pyramid-like shape. Once the convolutional network has learned these useful features from the image, we often flatten them and then feed them into a feed-forward neural network in order to do some task that we're interested in. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.